blue sky. Running water? Wow. Soap. Wow. <laughs> Restaurants? Well, I remember when those were legal. Oh, I remember <laughs> toilet paper. Uh. <laughs> exactly. See? Now we're thinking. Uh. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris talk about the past, present, and future potential of augmented reality. Plus, Telltale's Batman, Steins Gate, The Dispatcher, Grifters, Popeye, and Pokemon Go. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 81 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And our meaty topic of discussion for today is going to be augmented reality. Um, There's been a lot of talk recently about virtual reality, VR, um, but augmented reality has actually been around for quite a while as well and uh, is growing in some interesting ways and is kind of overlooked right now. I think it's got a lot of potential that people aren't really... Uh, appreciating, or maybe they're seeing augmented reality but not knowing that it is augmented reality. Um, a big example, of course, is Pokemon Go. Uh, that's been pretty big recently. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of other apps out there that take advantage of that technology that you might not even think of as being AR, especially if they're not games. Before we dive into that, though, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I've been pretty busy recently with a number of things going on in life, including moving into a new apartment, so that's been uh, taking up my time. So I found that whenever I do have time for games, which is not often, uh, I'm either in the mood just to kind of blow stuff up, so I'll go play Overwatch, or I'm in the mood to just sort of sit there and take something in, more so than having to think too hard. And so I've been playing a lot of, um, I guess what you can call, broadly speaking, story games. Uh, Things like uh, Telltale's Batman, I just played episode two recently. Um, some visual novels, uh, Phoenix Wright, the new one just came out for 3DS, and I've also been playing um, Steins Gate. I'll just sort of hit on a few really quick. Um, Steins Gate's very interesting because it's, it's been around for a little while from what I understand. I've never played it myself, never seen the anime, so the, uh, the story is completely new to me. The visual novel presentation is pretty standard, but you have this thing where you can press the right trigger if you're using the gamepad to bring up your cell phone. And this was in the sort of early, mid-2000s, so your cell phone is still not a smartphone at this point. Um, And you make choices and have interactions with people by basically reading and sending text messages. Um, So you'll read a message from someone, and they actually have an interesting way of letting you respond. You find sort of highlighted... um, phrases in there and you're responding to that phrase uh so for instance they might say something about a sandwich and you'll like highlight the sandwich thing and then you'll see what you would say sort of in response to the sandwich like oh yeah i'll I'll spot you for the sandwich next time or whatever the case might be that's just a hold the mustard hold the mustard yes (laughs) (laughs) um and then from what i understand and i've not seen too much of this yet because i'm still in the early chapters um but i've heard that there's a lot of branching and they sort of even in the introduction um mention the butterfly effect because it's a time travel story Hmm. um you can't actually physically travel back in time you can send information back in time um and apparently you can send back uh bananas because you got you have this wait one. wait 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 <laughs> stop you don't gloss over that <laughs> don't gloss over I, that. I was about to expand upon it but uh okay you're, you can you're, send bananas back in time <laughs> so they have this thing where um the the time travel device, as they call it, is what they call the phone wave. It's basically a microwave that you control remotely using a phone. So, for example, you can call your microwave, and there's like this little automated message thing that says, you know, enter the number of seconds you want to cook, and then you hit it, and then when you arrive back home, you've got something microwaved for you. Um, That's assuming you put it in there before you left. <laughs> right. Yes. Otherwise, you blew up your house. <laughs> yeah, well, you would, you would have have to. So, wait, uh, did the bananas go in the microwave? So, so, when they were testing it, they put bananas into the microwave, but they had a bug where you're supposed to hit, I think... Uh, uh, 120 and then pound, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's pound 120 if you want 120 seconds. But if you reverse the order, you put the pound before the numbers or whichever way it was, then apparently it turns back time. Because what they first observed is they called it the freezing effect, where the bananas would go, or actually it was a frozen chicken in this case. The frozen chicken would go back to its frozen state whenever they did this. 
uh, and then like they found that if they'd take off a banana from a bunch, put the bananas in there, then they'd get a banana back. Um, it would be appear back on the bunch. So, are you following any of this? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you lost me at banana. Yeah. <laughs> so, are you saying that I can put my black bananas in and get a nice, healthy, ripe banana out? In theory, yes. Okay. Th- now I'm interested. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. Now that makes more sense. Um, but basically, what they've discovered is not that it's because it's like fixing the bananas. It's because it's actually sending the bananas back in time or into a state where they were however long ago. Um, but, but the that, time is only changing in the microwave. Apparently. So, like, like you're not actually sending... Like, the banana is going back in time within the microwave, mm-hmm. but you're not... Like, I couldn't send bananas back to, like, myself 20 years ago. I don't believe so. No. And, like, they fall out of the sky, and now I've got But bananas. you could send yourself a text message uh, to however... So, to go out and buy some do more I bananas. Do <laughs> I need to go watch the movie Primer to understand how the time travel mechanic works in this? Well, see, that's... The, there weren't that's, enough bananas in that. That's that was the interesting my biggest thing. complaint. Uh, part of the reason that I haven't gotten to the branching yet, at least as far as I'm aware, is that they... Um, spend a lot of time trying to like set up like what the device is and how it mm. works or they're they're kind of like they're still puzzling out how things are working they're not entirely sure yet so i'm not entirely sure to be mm. honest um and so it does kind of suffer a little bit from a tendency in visual novels to kind of like over um what's what i'm looking for there, there tends to be a lot of exposition especially in the early going before you kind of like hit the meat of it but it's it's entertaining enough in the meantime yeah heavy rain had the same problem um now i was talking a little bit about this to uh, will parsons and he's not played the game either but um apparently he heard a thing and i have not verified this but it's intriguing if it is the case that you get a phone call the very first phone call you get in the game in like the opening couple of scenes mm-hmm. if you choose not to answer it apparently completely changes the ending Hmm. So I really? answered it because like, I kind of got the impression you, you had to, you are supposed to. Yeah. Um, but apparently you can choose not to answer the phone, and then the ending completely changes what the What kind of a monster doesn't answer a ringing phone? <laughs> That's, true. That's so true. Will Parsons? No. <laughs> it's, it's this, like, is, this is him hearsay, though. It's, it's like not. walking away from your initial three Pokemon in Pokemon Go <laughs> and just continually doing that and, and not catching any of them that'd be horrible yeah like who would do that don't mean you've got to catch them all i mean right and then um the second chapter of the batman telltale series is uh they they give you an option at one point which i thought was kind of cool where you have to go talk to the mayor about something and you can either go as batman and try to be intimidating or you can go as bruce wayne and uh kind of like use your guile and stuff like that um so it's interesting where you get to like make some choices like whether you're going to approach it as wayne or as batman that's interesting um did they ever throw in like trick choices like you're you are Bruce Wayne, but mm-hmm. a couple of the choices are just Batman choices. <laughs> like like shake the mayor's hand, punch him in the face. Yeah. Like, wait, don't wait, don't do that. No, 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 you're not Batman. I have but. not seen that happen yet. Okay, because that'd be pretty funny. Yeah, like punches him in the face, just like clocks him down in there. Everyone's like, Bruce, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm Batman. Oh wait, no, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, whoops, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not Batman. Um, Was that me? No, I didn't. Sorry, I'm not Batman. <laughs> um, they do some interesting things, and Jim, I think I was talking to you a little bit this off the a little bit about this off the air at one point. Um, um, where I'm curious to what extent they are borrowing from like more recent Batman stuff, or uh-huh. to what extent they might just be like doing totally new stuff with the property for the sake of the Telltale game to you know keep some surprise or maybe try something new. And so one of the big twists, and this isn't really a huge spoiler because it's at the end of Episode One, which you can play for free, that apparently um, Batman's parents were involved with the kind of like the crime lords of of Gotham. So you know you're they're in cahoots with Falcone and they're in cahoots with uh, the corrupt mayor. Mm-hmm. Mayor Hill, and uh, not even so much like it, I don't get the impression that it was necessarily forced upon them. They seem pretty uh, deeply entrenched, and so that kind of puts a twist on the whole um, you know Batman's parents getting murdered storyline because now it was actually it appears to have been a hit. And you're trying to figure out who ordered the hit and why and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, and I and I was when I was talking with you about it, um, I was thinking of current Batman comics, and mm-hmm. they've they've added that ripple somewhat recently as part of the Court of Owls storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, the Court of Owls are kind of this Illuminati of crime, I guess you could say, like rumored to exist, but it's like a secret society for criminals. Mm-hmm. And they, the Waynes were somehow involved and caught up in this. The, the idea of just how much or how you know, into it they were mm-hmm. is still kind of being source, sourced out. But it's become a major plot point in the new Gotham television series as well. Oh, interesting. So it's really not off-base to include something like that in the Telltale Batman. It'll mm-hmm. be interesting to see the direction they go with it. I, I don't think the final solution is, oh, okay, uh, or the final reveal, I should say, is that their parents were these hardcore crime bosses, mm-hmm. but you know more so that they were probably 
morally coerced great. into it mm-hmm. in some way, or it, they got it that got involved at one point for a reason they thought was a good idea, but mm-hmm. then they couldn't get out. Something like that, because that tends to happen with these sort of you know criminals. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I say that is just because of the amount of money that their family had always had. Unless you want to do something where you go back and go, oh, the family was always super involved in the crime, in which case that's typically is, is known. Mm-hmm. So unless you do that, then, then the question is why would a family that has this much money purposefully get so involved with organized crime? Mm-hmm. So there's usually a reason, but it's usually not a they're evil criminals reason. Mm-hmm. It's normally like, oh, we were losing all this money. We had to put, we were going to put people out of work, so we borrowed money from these mob bosses. And oh no, now we owe them money, and the interest is too much for us to pay. What do we do? Kind of situation, yeah, yeah. potentially. Who knows? But definitely involved in the hit. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. It, it, it changes that element of Batman's history, mm-hmm. which is one of the things that I don't like about that change to his mythos, because. When uh, the random criminal, later identified as Joe Chill, but his name doesn't really matter, the one who killed Bruce's parents, that became the moment where he decided he was going to be Batman. He became Batman in that moment, really, when his parents died was kind of the idea, like mentally speaking. Mm -hmm. And as Batman, his goal is to prevent senseless crime, like just seemingly senseless. There wasn't a reason for it. It was just they're trying to rob him. Uh, they get shot because his father's kind of trying to protect his mother. He's trying to fix the system that produced that sort of situation. Exactly, as yeah. opposed to there was there's some sort of broader conspiracy. There's um, a hit was put out on my parents, and then they died. Then it becomes more of a mission of sp- specifically revenge on a certain group that mm-hmm. did it, as opposed to I, there's no one for him to go after because it was a senseless crime. Mm-hmm. Like he actually finds in, in one of the Batman comics, this is, took place in I think the late '80s, um, where he finds finally identifies who it was that killed his parents. He couldn't figure it out, even though he's the greatest detective and all that, for so long, because it was a senseless crime. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, how do you how do you find someone that is just a random person that kills someone for seemingly no reason? Mm-hmm. Or in this case, it was just for robbery that became murder. But it's, how do you find someone like that? There's no connection to them, so it's, that's why it's so hard. Mm-hmm. So, but he finally did eventually find them. And when he did, he realized, I mean, he ended up, he doesn't, you know, kill him or hurt him or some sort of crazy way he is. He does see him go sent off to prison and all that kind of stuff. But he has this realization of this is just a guy. This isn't like the the villain that he had built up in his head. This is just a, you know, a criminal, a, a person that, you know, a, a product of the system, kind of like what you were saying before. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what Batman has always stood against, is mm-hmm. trying to, to end that sort of crime. Mm. And I think, to be fair, I think that this doesn't veer too far, at least not that I've seen in the series, it doesn't veer too far from that same sort of theme. Mm. Um, there's, like, this extra little twist of, um, like, you know, part of, the, part of the story right now is that the Wayne name is getting dragged through the mud as a result of some right. of stuff coming to light, and you're having to deal with that. Um, but they haven't really, like, taken that and been like, you know, while Batman is trying to figure out who killed his parents and why, it's not been, like, the, the focus of the story, which is cool. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So my understanding is that the new game Grifters is actually kind of hard to come by. Uh, But it turns out that Madness Games and Comics has a big old stack of them down the road. So uh, I was able to pick up a copy and try it out. Now, it's being billed as a hand-building game. Uh, You're familiar with the idea of a deck-building game, I'm Mm -hmm. sure. I'm not actually a huge fan of the mechanic of uh, deck-building games, just in general. But the idea of a hand-building game where you have... A full knowledge of where all your cards are at all times, the ones in play, the ones in your hand. Um, I really, really like this idea. What's cool about it is there are two ways to play cards. The the first is you can play them as a team, and a team will go out and do a job. Now, these are criminals, and so what you're doing is you're putting together kind of an Ocean's Eleven kind of team hmm. to get the job done. And there's three different types of um, People. I mean, basically, you've got your your, your heavies who, you know, they're the fists. They're mm-hmm. going to get stuff done. You've got your your thinkers. They're the ones who are going to go in there and mastermind the whole thing. And then you've got your stealths who are the, the thieves and that kind of thing. Uh, if you've ever watched the show Leverage, it kind of feels like that. Okay. Okay? Hmm. So what you're doing is you're building this team, which is in your hand, and then you're sending out the individuals to go here, to go there, do various jobs. Or they can go on their own and do a caper. Mm-hmm. And whenever they do a caper, you play them by themselves, 
and their special ability add acts. And this is where the game gets really interesting because you've got guys like drivers, you've got inside men, you've got femme fatales, you've got actual masterminds and thieves and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so anything from, turns out your guy was on my side and so I'm going to play it into your hideout and he comes over to me, mm-hmm. to the femme fatale speeding up time and letting me take a second turn, to the mastermind letting me draw from the deck and recruit new people. What you're doing is trying to balance in between uh, which jobs do I need to get done quickly because they get from easier to harder. And as the people do them, they're, the hard ones are going to come out. Versus how many uh, how team members do I need in my hand before I can be truly effective. And so whenever I played the first time, I actually had three jobs before anybody else had one. But then I stalled out <laughs> because I have to, you have to wait three turns uh, in order to get your teams back. And yeah, so they're, it, they're it's, hiding out, laying low. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the neat things about it is uh, you know exactly where they are and when they're going to come back to you, and you can plan for it. But you you got four-turn lag every time whenever you play either one card or that team, um, unless you are able to, to bring in uh, a special card that will, like, refresh them or something like mm-hmm. that. Anyway, it takes about half an hour to play. Uh, it's worth Every minute at a half hour, mm-hmm. it's in that dystopia universe, which okay. is kind of cool. Uh, Dystopian. So, we, we've talked about this. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. <laughs> I wish it was dystopia universe, but, but uh, <laughs> it, it's the uh, it's it's the coup universe. In mm-hmm. other words, yeah, you know, the the coup, what, the resistance, resistance, yeah, yeah all that stuff. Um, and, and, and it feels it. It's it's called on the fringes of the dystopian universe. Gotcha. That's cool. Um, and it sounds like then the sort of the way they bring in... Belly. Because one of the, the common themes in the dystopian universe games is uh, where do your loyalties lie? Yeah. And so it's interesting you mentioned the thing about like, oh, it turns out your person's actually working for yeah. me and that sort of thing. Um, is there a lot of sort of like direct sort of subvert competition between players like you're trying to kind of like mess with their plans or somehow throw them off? Well, the very fact that you have to get the job before they do builds that into the system. Mm -hmm. But yeah, actually there's a lot of interaction between your guys and my guys, my guys becoming your guys, me taking your money. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that I really love about it, some games you get all this money, you do stuff with money, and in the end it's about who has the most victory points or Mm -hmm. fame or whatever. This is the guy with the most money wins. Okay. Period. Mm -hmm. It's like real life. It's, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, no, you, you're, you're doing capers and you're doing heists and you're doing that sort of thing. And then the guy with the most money at the end, winner. Cool. It's I'll, a great game. I'll have to give it a uh, try. If you can find it, pick it up. It's, uh, it's called Grifters and it is uh, really well priced. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then we like to talk about the other stuff. So I've been a big fan of Audible recently. Um, I, I do a lot of driving around, you know, and stuff like that. And eventually you get tired of the radio and you get tired of the same sort of music and stuff like that. And so when I run out of podcasts to listen to in the car, I've uh, turned to audiobooks. And I really like Audible, actually. And this is the kind of a free plug. You know, there's a lot of podcasts that monetize by um, getting people to sign up for free trials of Audible. Uh, that's not what this is. This is just me talking about how uh, I tend to like it. So this is for um, free. Yes, this is We're for giving free. this away for yeah, free. free. Free advertising. This is a plug. Right? <laughs> Audible. This is a plug for you to give us money. Yeah, some podcasts actually get paid to talk about Audible, but we're giving it away for free. Woo! Wait. Uh, but anyway, uh, the reason I bring this up is because one of the books I listened to recently is actually an Audible Studios production. I think this is a new effort of theirs. They're actually producing their own audiobooks and rather than just selling them. And I guess they wanted to promote this one in particular. It's a book called The Dispatcher by John Scalzi. And it is currently free. It's actually free through November 2nd, I believe. That's a Wednesday. And so uh, by the time this comes out, you'll probably have a week, two weeks if you want to go grab it. Um, doesn't hurt. You know, free is free. is free. It's interesting because it's a novella length, I believe. It's about two and a half hours to uh, have it read to you. And the reader is actually um, Zachary Quinto, uh, who you might know as Spock from the new Star Trek. Um, he does a pretty good reading of it. He puts like you know some the good fake Spock. Yeah, the, the fake Spock. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Fox. It's Spork. Spock. It's Spork. Oh, Spork. He uh, he does some good work with uh, putting different voices on the characters so you can differentiate them. Um, in some scenes where there's a lot more sort of emotion to the dialogue, he's able to put that in there. So they actually don't say read by Zachary Quinto. They say performed by Zachary Quinto. And I actually think it's not not a bad way to put it in this particular case. But as you're as you're listening, do you ever think to yourself? This would sound a lot better if Leonard Nimoy was the one. <laughs> I did not find myself thinking that, uh, but anyway. Um, so uh, 
John Scalzi might know. Uh, he's a fairly well-known sci-fi author. Uh, he did Red Shirts, uh, Fuzzy Nation, Old Man's War, um, not all of which I've read. Um, but he tends to be a pretty good author in general. And the reading is good. It's free. I recommend checking it out. And you can kind of you can listen to it in less time uh, than watching most movies. Uh, and if you're interested at all in the premise, the, basically the idea is that um, when you're murdered in this universe, uh, it takes place in Chicago primarily. So it's that's, totally, totally it's different universe. Murder, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's true to life, uh, unfortunately. 999 times out of 1,000, you come back. You appear back in your bed um, and, like, without whatever condition it was that was inflicted upon you uh, at the time that you were murdered, like, kind of rever- reverses your state by a few hours. To so wake up and you're like, well, that sucked. <laughs> On to my day. Yeah, exactly. So is this technology or? Or is this God just going, is, uh, you know what, this isn't working? Un- unanswered, but yeah, they, that is, like, a lot of people, the popular theory is, like, there, it's somehow an act of God or there's something some, like There's that. some angel up there, he's, like, on, on the computer, he just keeps hitting, like, Control-Z. Mm-hmm. Heaven's full. Yeah, Control-Z, <laughs> Control-Z, Control-Z. Sorry, guys, no room. Control-Z, Control-Z. <laughs> and so um, the main character, the protagonist, is um, what is called a dispatcher. And basically they are uh, licensed, bonded people who have been trained and are authorized to kill people on purpose when they're deemed... Uh, y- unsavable in an accident or say it's part of like a risky surgery or something like that so that they can be brought back and either be you know saved or get another shot at the surgery that went wrong that sort of thing um it's a really interesting book they they sort of explore the and the implications of that um and for a nice quick read for free i'd definitely recommend checking it out yeah i've been actually working through the lord of the rings for class and rob inglis is the narrator on that one Mm -hmm. does a brilliant brilliant job of all of the uh Impressions and that sort of a thing. You can really tell where where Jackson got some of his uh, inspiration for directing hmm. various, uh, you know, and, and and doing the casting that kind of thing, straight out of the impressions that he was doing. Interesting, uh, like Treebeard and, and whatnot. So, hmm. uh, yeah, I recommend those too. Those are those are pretty great, and uh, they've got a huge library. Yeah, it's, amazing it's, library. It's pretty massive. Yeah, and in fact, they've got they've got some weird stuff on there too that you wouldn't expect. Some lectures and things hmm. like that. Yeah, they have uh, a whole nonfiction fiction section. Yeah. Um, I'm actually listening right now to a little bit of uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Oh, really? Uh, which has been kind of interesting. That's so. neat. I picked up uh, Thomas F. Madden's The Modern Scholar, The Lost Warrior, Tales of the Templar. And it's actually just a lecture <laughs> series for oh, fun. Uh, some of the stuff we're doing for, for Doc and Kruger. So. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I highly recommend Audible. And uh, maybe at some point we'll come back and we'll actually start uh, getting getting paid for these uh, these adverts. Oh, we'll I know. <laughs> Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. Okay, so I, I decided to take a trip down memory lane and play some old arcade games. And I actually got into this game called Popeye, which is something that I never really played back in the day, but was a pretty well-known arcade game. Well, actually, I, Eats Me Spinach? Yes, yes. Okay. The Popeye, just like the cartoons, which I did watch a lot as a kid, to be honest. Yeah, so did I. So the, the arcade game has an interesting story in and of itself. Originally, Donkey Kong, which came out before the Popeye arcade game that I'm talking about, mm-hmm. but originally, in 1981, Nintendo wanted to make a Popeye game because of how, how popular the character was. It was everywhere still at that point. Um, and Nintendo wasn't, I guess, confident enough in their abilities, particularly overseas, to sell a game unlicensed with new characters. So they were trying to get the license for the Popeye characters, and they thought they had a deal, but it didn't quite go through in time. So they came up with Mario and Donkey Kong, or in that, in that time it was Jumpman. And of course, you know, the rest is history. The characters completely, the game was a smashing success. Uh, the characters, of smashing. course, are still around to this <laughs> like day. Barrels. Yes, smashing. I see what you did there. <laughs> but but uh, Popeye, they still were able to get the license a few years later, and so in 1983, they released the Popeye arcade game, and it actually did not go over quite as well. It was not as um, popular, I, I guess you could say, as the Donkey Kong um, cabinet was. It was still it was still a popular game that was all over the place, but. It didn't quite have the same sort of esteem, and it did a couple of weird things. Like, for one thing, it's still a platformer, like like many of the arcade games at that time. They were usually maze games, uh, shooters, as in shoot 'em ups or, or platformers. Mm-hmm. But in this platformer, you actually can't jump, which is kind of odd, particularly coming from Nintendo that had sort of established the jump mechanic is so crucial to their mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. Um, in Popeye, there are platforms, and, of course, you play as Popeye, and um, olive oil is... 
throwing something down at you that you have to collect. So in the first level, it's um, hearts that hmm. represent her little kisses. Aww. And in another, oh, bye bye. Right. In another level, she's like serenading you with music, and you have to pick up the musical notes. Hmm. And you know, in another level, it's she's yelling for help, so you pick up letters that spell out "Help me." Hmm. So little things like that. Um, but you can't you can't jump, so that so you have to use the stairs to go around the different levels, or just fall. Hmm. You do have a punch attack, but your punch only works on things like birds or skulls. You can't punch Bluto. If Bluto touches you, basically, you're dead. Hmm. Unless you find a can of spinach. Of course. Of that's, course. Of yeah. course. And that's the power up. And once you have sp- <laughs> Yes. And once you have the spinach, of course that plays, that song yeah, plays. Yeah. And once you have the spinach, um, the whole the whole game basically Bl- Bluto is coming after you. You have to kind of avoid him, but pick up all the hearts or whatever. And sometimes there's other hazards that you can punch. But sometimes spinach will spawn near the edges of the stage. And if you go over there and use your punch to pick up a spinach, because you can't just walk over it, mm-hmm. you become, you know, super Popeye, you kind of get all red, and then Bluto immediately just runs away from you. And so your whole goal is now to go after Bluto. Very similar to uh, Pac-Man's mechanic, where the ghosts are always coming after right. you. The second you get the power pellet, you now have to run after them, because mm-hmm. they're going to run away from you, and you want to get them. So the same thing happens here. You, you will knock Bluto into the water... And you have a little bit of extra time to pick up all your remaining hearts, mm-hmm. etc. So is spinach that high in protein? No, it's a big metaphor for drug addiction. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, if you ever wondered why she was so skinny, you know, heroin. Uh, uh, I think it was PC- meth. It was this methamphetamine. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Popeye was the PCP. That's addict. what I'm saying. Popeye's PC- <laughs> PCP. Yeah. Gotta watch those guys. Uh, uh, he also was really good at th- thumb wrestling because it's yeah. all forearm strength. His mm-hmm. forearms were massive. Right? Yeah. yeah tiny totally. biceps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Bluto, um, Bluto was probably a cop. He was probably an arc. Probably so. Yeah. A jerk. <laughs> well, speaking of Popeye, I decided to play another Popeye game, um, and it's Popeye 2. So there was actually another game that came out um, for the Game Boy system, and it, it was by uh, Sunrise Entertainment. Later it was licensed for the U.S. and Europe by Activision, but they decided this time around... To and it was it was actually came out in 1991, which is kind of a later Game Boy game, a little bit later. Game Boy I think came out in 89, 88. The odd thing about this game is they decided to make it a full on platformer like Super Mario Bros. So you're Popeye, you have an extremely long arm. This is one of the weird things. About the arm. <laughs> your your arm is is longer than you are tall. It's huge, and you can only do you can jump and you can just kind of swing your fist at at things like crabs. <laughs> It's not a good game. I actually feel like they, they stole sprites from Super Mario Land, which was a, of course, Nintendo game that came out on the Game Boy, which was actually a really good game. This game is not really good. Um, it's actually quite frustrating. I can see why I didn't hear of it before. <laughs> but I was just, I had played Popeye that day, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to see about playing Popeye 2 and see if the sequel's any good. It's not. <laughs> it's not at all. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Okay, so it's been a while since we talked about Pokemon Go, but there's been a lot of changes since the changes. Um, the brief version and the cynical version might be that this great game came out with lots of really cool features. They realized it was a strain on the server, and they stripped out a bunch of fever, uh, fe- So they stripped out a bunch of features, lost a bunch of uh, fans and players, and now they're slowly building back up to what they do, which is Niantic. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the good news is that some of the features are back. And some new features are in, too. So it's, it's kind of neat. Um, for example, uh, the other day... On October 12th, they released a new patch, version uh, 1.11.2, which has catch bonuses included in it. Uh, trainers can earn a catch bonus for a Pokemon type as they catch more of a specific type. So, you know, this whole... Uh, you mean like bug type, fire type, fighting type? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But what it means is if, if all you're getting is Pidgeys, because that's where you, you, you live, you can actually get kind of a, a bonus for that within, within that. Uh, this is the thing that, that interests me the most because I, I think I've done gym fights like maybe twice mm-hmm. ever because it's just not the way I play. I'm more of a collector and explorer and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, updated gym training. Trainers can now bring six Pokemon to battle at friendly gyms and the CP of the Pokemon you are battling may be temporarily adjusted to lower your training session. Mm-hmm. So this is a big problem people are noticing mm-hmm. is that they're not getting together together to go battle at gyms like they did with uh, 
some of the other Niantic games. And so as a result, what you've got is your strongest Pokemon against the weakest one at the gym, and if you can't beat it, you're done. So basically what it what it's doing now is it's it's leveling them down so that you can do that. And and this is a kind of a, a tactic that's coming out of MMORPG mm-hmm. land, which I think is really great, where if you team up with somebody who's too high level for you, then then they'll kind of level them down, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Guild Wars 2 did it. Yeah. Um, other ones did it. So I think this is a really great sign. So, so does it make it so that if you go to a gym now, you don't always have to feel like you can't do anything? Right. Because, right. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll come back later. And then when you come back I'm, later, I'm level, it's also leveled up too. Right. Yeah. Like exactly. I, I'm level 15 after like four months and someone out there is like level 30 and they've got like the right. the Gyarados with like, you know, 4,000 CP. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. at the top and there's six other right before yeah. you. No, you're never going to take that gym. Mm-hmm. Right. Ever. Now, what's intended in the design, and a lot of people don't even realize this, is that if you get a part going like you literally throw a pokemon party and everybody gets together and goes and hangs out at the gym which is the you know the pizza place where you're going you can all throw in together and take over that gym while you're sitting there at the table Hmm. this is what should be happening no one's talking about it no one's doing it and for some reason it's just not the compelling factor of the game Um, now i think one of the reasons why is because a lot of people abandoned the game whenever they took out tracking Hmm. um but I think that since tracking wasn't really working the way they wanted it to in the in the first place, that that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope that they're working on tracking. I hope they will bring back tracking. Mm. But um, I'm I'm pleased. I think that there's generally been a lot of progress, and um, I think that we need to give it another shot. Mm-hmm. So if it's been a while since you've played and you didn't know that there were companions now, for example, mm-hmm. um, I was that, gonna I was gonna mention the yeah. name way I play well, talk, right now. Yeah, talk yeah. talk about it. I mainly use Pokemon Go's pedometer, <laughs> like not because I'm like using it. To to track how far I go, but because I'll go for a walk and I'll turn it on, and like I don't even necessarily catch much as I go for walks because it's all pidgeys. Um, but I'll leave it on and I'll hatch eggs that way. Um, and so while I'm at that, I might like the the buddy that you can bring along with you. you select one of your Pokemon that you have, and um, it will find candies after you walk a certain number of kilometers yeah, of its type. And so what I've been doing is uh, I don't find Magikarps very often, but you need like 400 Magikarp Magikarp candies to make a Gyarados. Right. Uh, so what I've been doing is like slowly getting one candy at a time and what's nice about Magikarp is at least at the level that I'm at um, I don't know if maybe it goes up over time no it's based on type Mm, okay. Uh, so you're getting one candy mm-hmm. every mile or every kilometer, every, every kilometer. or so, right? And then I know it's Eevee it. was one every five kilometers. Right. And that's that's what I've got. I've got the, the what's a flame type of Eevee called? Uh, Flareon. I don't even know. I named I changed the name. Mm-hmm. So. I, I named mine Rick Flareon. Oh, oh very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I approve. <laughs> well, I, I have one of the water types, and he's Mr. Bubbles. So, oh, nice. <laughs> uh, he, he and I hang out. We go on walks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't actually have a dog, but if I did, I'd, I'd be walking my dog. Instead, I walk my, uh, my two-year-old and, mm-hmm. and, and the Pokemon. So it's it's not going to get you a lot of candies very quickly, but it's just like one more way to steadily get some over time. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Give it a, give it a try if you haven't uh, tried it recently. See if uh, the changes are, are good enough to keep you going. You're saying if if you've Pokemon stopped, you should Pokemon go. <laughs> yes. Again. Go again. Okay. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so it is time to talk about augmented reality. Uh, I feel like the academic in me must give a bit of a disclaimer here. Mm. Uh, in 2006, 2007, I was researching alternate reality games, the other AR mm-hmm. game. Um, and back then, a lot of people were really confused. And, and hold on, for, for those that don't know, alternate reality, are we talking about the Matrix here? Right. No, and then that's exactly... The problem. Um, no, we're talking about coded websites and that sort of thing. Actually, the best place that you can go for that is ARGN.com. It'll tell you all about it. Mm. That's what I wrote my dissertation on with Deus City. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's completely different from virtual reality. In fact, whenever I met with the money, which I did a couple of times, uh, there were some venture capitalists who were interested in what we were doing. Um, and they would always say, well, can you do it in Second Life? Can you, it tells you a little bit about the era. <laughs> can, can you do it in virtual reality? What about this 
augmented reality. I just saw I've been this new about movie, that. Uh, Lawnmower Man. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> not that. Not that. It long. wasn't that old. Uh, it was Lawnmower Man Two. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, beyond cyberspace. Uh, it's sad that I know that. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't even then. Uh, but the point is this: we're not talking about any of that. We're not talking about virtual reality. We're not talking about augmented reality. Uh, or, I'm sorry. Although we're not talking about alternate reality games, we're talking about augmented reality. Mm. AR. Um, and whenever this first started, it was um, this new thing that was going to be coming out soon. And, and this was in, I don't know, 06, 07, 08. Um, and it shows you could see people with headsets had this um, augmented experience where they could see that there was stuff on the table that was, wasn't was really there. And Drive around the, remote control cars. And was the, the DS? Was the, I know the 3DS does it too, but didn't the DS do it first, I think? Well, and that's the thing. It, it came out in a lot of different ways mm-hmm. okay. and did a lot of different things, but the truth is now it's everywhere. It's on yeah. phones. It's it's all that. Pokemon, Pokemon Go, Go Pokemon uses Go. it that's, in one form. Yes. Because, see, the thing is, the, the, the Pokemans, they don't know uh, what they're standing on or not standing on. Mm-hmm. It's all an illusion. Um, so when we walk around in the real space, that's one form of the AR. But then whenever it flips over into AR mode and you're seeing the camera, all it's done is just replace the background with your camera's mm-hmm. throughput. And I imagine that they try to estimate based on like an average person's height and like the tilts of the camera and stuff like that. They know they know how big the Pokemon are supposed to be, and so they'll put them a certain length away from you in theory. And so they do their best to try to make it look like it's a Pokemon of its actual size in your actual environment. Uh, so when you're like looking around, and like you'll notice that there's a difference when you have AR on and off. When it's off, it's just kind of like a screen with a standard background, right. and they're always going to be in the same place. With That's AR, right. you can look around, look up and down. They mm-hmm. might go off your screen because they're supposed to be fixed to a location. Yep. Um, but, but you can force mm-hmm. the perspective on it. If yeah. you're standing across the Grand Canyon um, and you look to the other side, mm-hmm. you can have the largest rotata you've ever seen. It's <laughs> 70 stories tall, yeah. and you can defeat it. Or you can be looking at your knee and have like the, just the tiniest Charizard That's you've ever right. seen. That's <laughs> right. Uh, but the, the thing is, you can also throw the Pokeball across the Grand Canyon. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, not, it's not smart. It's mm-hmm. not intuitive. It's not intelligent. Um, so understanding that there's limitations right now within that context, and the really heavy AR stuff knows what a table is. Mm-hmm. It's actually right. processing things in 3D space. Um, and so that that's a different kind mm-hmm. of AR. That's and that's, that goes right. back to that anchor comment I mentioned with uh, Popeye earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, example, you mentioned the 3DS. When that came out, they had these little AR cards. And what right. you would do is you'd yes. place them on the table, and there's a specific side yeah. where you'd, you'd face that side up, and it would look for a symbol, and it would take the size of the symbol, and the facing, and the angle, and all this different stuff, and it would understand that if it sees the uh, if it sees the symbol at this angle, it needs to project the 3D object at this angle. Mm-hmm. You can also tell fa- how far away it is, and that sort of that's thing. That's right. They're, they're kind of like QR codes in that sense, mm-hmm. same technology, um, except that it, it project, quote-unquote, projects mm-hmm. through through what you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, so are you suggesting that we could have augmented reality games where people go around with little Nerf guns that shoot out little a- AR cards with stickers on them, and then you shoot them and you stick them to something, and then you use your camera to you know display whatever object it is coming off the card? That's not a bad idea. Yeah, um, we we could definitely use real stickers. I want to shoot people with stickers. I think that's what I was getting at. Oh, oh, I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the camera has to be able to see the the thing you're referencing. So, well, if someone was playing, let's let's say you and let's say all three of us are playing this game that we're we're talking about, this theoretical game. Okay, I could shoot a virtual sticker at your virtual uh, presence. Okay, which the the game would know where you are in real time. Um, so we could play. I don't know. Let, let's think of it as uh, paintball, mm-hmm. and we could play paintball within a AR type of space. I actually, um, this was my game that I designed for your game design class mm-hmm. when I was a freshman, <laughs> freshman or sophomore in college. Um, when we were supposed to do a game design document for a hypothetical game, I decided to try to make an AR thing. And, of course, this was when AR was just a concept more yeah. than anything. Um, and I think I actually came up with this before Google Glass was a thing. Um, but my my kind of concept was it was going to have a device. I came up with this hypothetical device of, like, it should be able to do these things. And one of it was using your GPS in the same way that, say, Pokemon Go does. Right. Yeah. Um, where you'd be looking around, and it would recognize where other devices are. It would know how high it is, in theory. Um 
it would know your location. And basically, I had kind of like a territory control game in mind where um, you'd have geolocated objects that you can see when you're in the game world. Mm-hmm. And you'd be able to basically, like, you know, kind of play laser tag by holding your virtual gun in your hands. Right. Or whatever the case might be. Um, and so you'd have a lot of people, like, in fields, you know, with these glasses running around acting like they're shooting each other. And people would be driving by wondering what the heck's going on or just thinking they're really mm-hmm. dorky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but that was, that was the kind of the idea that I was developing. Nice. These are the sort of experiences that we could be having with augmented reality yeah. at some point. And, and because we all have, you know, we bring our phones everywhere, um, it's, it's not like the, the virtual reality mm-hmm. giant head helmet thingamajig mm-hmm. that we all have to buy that costs like 400 bucks. On top of making sure you have the hardware to run it. Right, yeah. and also buying like a, like a powerful PC rig or in the case of, say, even like PlayStation VR, it's not like a PS4 is free. Mm-hmm. It's like 400 bucks. Yeah. Even if you already have it, you still got to buy the VR for it. Mm-hmm. So, Which and, is like another 400, 500. Right. Yeah. And, and plus, now you are tethered. You can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. You are now here. This is your space where you will play this VR game. Yeah. With augmented reality, if it, if it could interact with um, maybe a phone, but also we have things like, like you were talking about, Google Glass, some sort of glasses or some sort of yeah, thing watches, you can wear on your face or the new Apple Watches, new Apple watches yeah. something that you can carry along with you, small enough to carry along, mm-hmm. potentially cheap enough that people could buy them or have already bought them for some other purpose like a phone. People aren't buying phones for Pokemon mm-hmm. Go. They already have a phone. Right. Um, and if you could, then you can carry those along and you can now play these games socially because that's, I think, the benefit of augmented reality is mm-hmm. that it lends itself to social experiences because you're taking the... the the um, the phone or the watch or the glasses or whatever device it is with you everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. And then other people can possibly see what you're seeing as well in mm-hmm. the game from their own perspective. Mm-hmm. And there have been a number of kind of experiments in this area. I think at one point, I, I don't remember what it was called, um, but there was some project I remember hearing, but it might have even been an internal thing at UTD where people were, um, they had like kind of a platform. It's almost like a social media platform in a sense where yeah. everyone who's using it has to have the same app. But you could like post things in your environment and then people would be able to walk up to it with their AR and see whatever it was that you posted there. Um, so you might like you know have some writing on a wall or on a rock or something like that, or you might like post a video in a spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and there have been a few experiments along these lines. Like for example, there's this app called Erasma, or Erasma, however it's pronounced. Um, that we actually used at my uh, at my work at one point, um, where we had these posters. Mm-hmm. And you could walk up to the poster, and it was AR powered, so that as soon as you're looking at the poster, it would actually replace the poster with the, the frame of the video we're making. So you can either design it be kind of like replacing that frame, mm-hmm. or you can make it so that something kind of animates inside the frame cleverly. And so we had this guy, you know, one of the guys in my company, who acted in this thing. He was kind of like standing there with his arms crossed and looking at you, and it's kind of like this, like, hey, come check out this poster. You start, you hold your phone up to the poster with the Erasma app, and all of a sudden he is start he in the poster starts talking to you, doing all this stuff, and then he returns to his arms folded thing as if he, like he just st- stopped animating. Um, so you can kind of do some clever things like that. So, um, so we have we have Halloween coming up before too long. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's an angle of you know in the future Halloween parties. Everybody, if everyone has these glasses, perhaps mm-hmm. uh, integrated into them for um, augmented reality, mm-hmm. they can just wear special makeup based on what they think their costume should be, but don't have to wear a full costume or mm-hmm. something like that. And then when you wear, when you see it through the augmented reality, your costume becomes much more elaborate, like mm-hmm. an actual, real something that you would see in Hollywood type costume, mm-hmm. Hollywood film mm-hmm. costume, as opposed to. Generally speaking, the like weak knockoffs that most people have uh, outside of like dedicated cosplayers that, that go right. all out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I mean, I think there's kind of a few ways you could do that, and you know, the technology is still developing. So we might find start finding solutions that don't require this. But like, you know, say for instance, you had a mask with like one of those barcodes we mentioned. Right. And so if you're facing front, then like you know, anytime someone can see that barcode, there's just a mask that replaces your mm-hmm. face. Um, and if you wanted to keep adding items, you might like have something on your shoulders to do that on your chest, right. on your legs. Right. And so it could be tracking all those different things and then sort of simulating, uh, like sort of projecting on top of each of those things a different object to get like a full figure and, thing. And then you have that one jerk at the party that goes around with like stickers of like different <laughs> little codes like that. Yeah. You just start sticking them on people's backs and you yeah. look at it and you're like, suddenly why, why is there a like leg a, on this guy's yeah, back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like what that, why does that, why does that monster have a tail now or what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Or you could have things where, like, you know, it's more GPS based. And there's, again, we've sort of mentioned there's like different types of AR. Uh, something that's more geolocation, where you're walking around, you've got your app out for Halloween, and you step within 50 yards of this person's house, and they make it so that there are bats flying around and some music starts playing or something like that. Right, right. Um, so you can kind of like set up these little, little entertaining tidbits, you know. Using the AR. So with with AR, while we're talking about all these different experiences you can have, where does that put gaming? Because if we're talking about something like Pokemon Go, I really wouldn't consider that a game, per se. Well, no, it's gamified. Right. And it has... Um, well, certainly game, game elements, elements in it, of course. But right. I wouldn't... I wouldn't consider it a game. Well, but but could could there be could there be augmented reality game? What about Ingress? Do you think Ingress is a game? I Do you remember it. Ingress? That's that's Niantic's other thing. Uh, oh, that's right. We talked about it some. It's, it's the territory control game that doesn't end. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly has more. It certainly is much closer to being a game than Pokemon Go. I, I honestly, I don't want to judge it one way or the other without really knowing well, more about it. It's kind of funny because um, Pokemon Go wouldn't exist without Ingress. It mm-hmm. actually uses Ingress's data. Mm-hmm. And, and like things like the Pokestops were populated um, by the players. Of Ingress, and, yeah. And, and sort of their request to make things into, I don't even know what they were called, but they were like stations. Portals. Portals, that's mm-hmm. what it was. Um, and, and so... It's kind of interesting because the the cre- well co creator uh, John Hank actually talks about this. He said that the overnight success of Pokemon Go took twenty years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason why he <laughs> is saying that is he's one of the guys who was on the original MMO. Um, it was uh, Meridian Fifty Nine. You heard of this one? I've played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. I mean, he was one of the co-creators on that, right? This is in nineteen ninety six. It's one of the earliest ones. He leaves the team in two thousand to launch Keyhole. Right. This is to come up with a way to link maps to aerial photography and create the first online GPS linked three D aerial map of the world. Mm-hmm. So he does this. Well, guess whose attention he gets? Google. Yeah, I Google, was about to say Google. Google buys Keyhole, yeah. hires him, and then, you know, basically Google Earth, Google Maps is born. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, so you've got all that tied into it. And then he ran the Google Geo team from 2004 to 2010 uh, and collects the, the team that basically is going to create Pokemon Go and launches Niantic as a startup funded by Google to create game layers on Maps. Mm-hmm. So... It, I mean, 20 years of project, but you see, so one of the problems we have with AR right now, from a three guys sitting around a table perspective, is we aren't Google. Yeah. We don't have Google's data. Right. We don't have access to um, their API. We don't have access to any of that mm-hmm. stuff. And so this is something that is layered on um, a, a massive structure like Google Earth mm-hmm. that... I think Niantic requires not, it. Not with Google anymore. Not anymore. Been, yeah. But that's not the point. Yeah. Um, is that they were they were a startup funded by Google, still making tons of money off of them. Mm-hmm. But, um, what, regardless, the the whole point is that you kind of need that data. Mm-hmm. You need right. that um, that that. Well, it it, it almost kind of reminds me of whenever I was doing alternate reality games. One of the reasons why I did it whenever I was. Uh, Back, you know, in, in in school, is that nobody was writing about it. It was private companies that had the models, mm-hmm. and the only company out there that had published its player participation model was Forty Two Entertainment. And so I did my dissertation about uh, Forty Two Entertainment's uh, triangular pyramid model of uh, player participation. Mm-hmm. The, the, basically, the the model still applies, and that's why I'm tying it back in here. Mm-hmm. So within something like augmented reality games. What you've got is a tip of the wedge that is going to be very enthusiastic about it, and they're going to be out there capturing stuff, wanting to change stuff, wanting to change the story. Mm-hmm. You know, they're involved in the meta basically. Uh, and then you've got a secondary group which play, but they they interact very, very casually. And then a third player group which kind of is interested and watches, but uh, maybe plays a little, does some of the collecting, but they're not they're not going to be making any changes. It's not going to be doing any battles or anything like that. Goodness, certainly no. So the numbers are actually really interesting because um, 
those most enthusiastic players, the ones who are actually going to change things and, and be the ones who you know change the story, are the most active. They're the ones who have like the I don't even know what the, the cap level is right now, but like level seventy five, <laughs> and they've got the four thousand CP Pokemon out there on the top of the tower. You know that's going to be one in a thousand players, yeah. maybe, mm-hmm. maybe even less. Um, and then one out of say a hundred players is going to be those who are active and they're into it and they they battle, but they don't they're not top level that kind of a thing. And then the rest, you're talking mm, maybe like uh, 900 out of 1,000, right? They're, they're just going to be your casual players. They're those who never made it to level 10 or mm-hmm. 11 or 12 or 15 and don't care. Yeah. Uh, but they're enjoying the sort of experience of, oh, wow, look, a, a Pikachu. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Go chase him. Go get him. Go quit your job. Go go find him. No. <laughs> no it's, it's, it's cool. He's on the side of the road, and I'm going to be late. No, yeah. no biggie. You know, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, drive po- or don't play Pokemon while driving. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> oh, really don't, man. It's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. People have, have died. Yes. People have walked off cliffs for mm-hmm. Pokemon. But I'm sure Pokemon has also saved people's life. Like, if I hadn't been out of the house playing Pokemon, when it burned down, uh, I don't know, something. Sure. Let's go when the that. meteor hit it. <laughs> but, no, but I, I agree with you. I do think augmented reality will be similar to alternate in that, in that sense. Yeah, in, in terms of the player right, in terms of the player model. And that's what I'm talking about. Right. That's where the similarity ends. I, I think that we need to get to that point, though, where we can have, not just on our phones, because I think that's gr- it's great that we do, but we have to pull our phone out mm-hmm. right. to play still. Right. So we need, I mean, the Google Glass is a good idea. It just, I think it was before its time. Yeah. Because it didn't, it didn't work. Google Glass clearly, I mean, are we at that point now where we can all admit that it's, it's a failure? Because <laughs> I think Google has. <laughs> right? I mean, it's basically, right. right. I mean, but I, but I still think it was a good idea. It's just before its time. People weren't the technology wasn't quite there. People weren't quite ready for the buy-in. Mm-hmm. Um, Apple has a smartwatch, which is kind of similar to some of the some of the things that the, mm-hmm. that the Google Glass was going to do. Mm-hmm. But it's on your watch. You have to look down to see it, as right. opposed to it's always there. So I think having that HUD, um, it's essentially what it is. You you just have a, a HUD everywhere, mm-hmm. and I think that's on your face. And I think that's going to appeal to gamers who are used to that experience. In video games, yeah. and and you you think in video games, all this useful information about what's going on in the world around you, in the game world around you, at all times. Well, what if we could do that in the real world and mm-hmm. carry that same concept? We'll walk over. up to a restaurant and immediately see the Yelp reviews for that restaurant, right? Or whatever whatever happens to be you know contextually yeah. relevant for where you are. That's actually a great idea, and I think it's it's going to have a lot of appeal. And and as gamers continue to get older and continue to be in these positions. And the technology gets there, which I don't. I just don't think it's there quite yet. But within about five years, I, I think it certainly could be. Mm-hmm. Google Glass as an idea or something similar, and it very well could be Google because of how much money they have. It might be them again coming out with something similar. My money's on Amazon. Um, it could be Amazon. They have they have the money for it. It could be Apple. Um, you know, hell, I mean, Nintendo could be involved as well. I mean, these, there's a lot of companies that could potentially. Be involved in something like this. It's exciting. It really is exciting. I admire your fanboy lust for <laughs> <laughs> enthusiasm for Nintendo. Uh, hey, I, I'm I'm a hardcore Nintendo. Fan. I mean, we've seen we've seen Nintendo and Apple team up, um, right? With yes. the that's kind of what Super I'm Mario at. Run. Yeah, um, they, it would have to be a team. Nintendo does not have the department to mm-hmm. do something like this. Uh, or or all that extra data that you're talking about. Yeah. So it would have to be they work with another company. Right. As they proved with Mitomo, they are not the most brilliant whenever it comes to mobile space. Well, there's, they got a couple of new things coming out. We'll see how those go. Uh, Mitomo, I think, was just kind of like a getting their foot wet, sort of. Yeah, I don't think Mitomo was ever really... I, I think they were probably surprised at how very popular it was for a short time. Because mm-hmm. I don't think it was even meant to be that. I think, like Chris was saying, it was just a, hey, let's let's put this out there and Experiment. see what happens. Yeah, huh. um, It also came out very quickly after they announced that they were going mobile. Um, I think the next ones, the next big ones are coming out with, aside from Super Mario Run, which I think is sometime in November, um, they also have... Uh, the he new does fi- need to run, too, yeah. let's be honest. He's been a little pudgy. <laughs> um, but they have a Fire Emblem coming out, and they have an Animal Crossing coming out for mobile. And then both of those, I think, could actually work really well on mobile. So I'm curious to see what they do there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, can you imagine Animal Crossing AR? I, I, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, that, that would be, be really amazing. Cool. <laughs> um, why, why aren't they thinking along those lines? Well, and I think the answer comes back to they don't have the access to the data they would need in order right. to do it. Yes. They don't yes. have the satellites in mm-hmm. orbit. Now, with that being said, 
there's also, like, I, I think there are other forms of AR that we could consider. And speaking of Nintendo, mm-hmm. uh, again, with the 3DS, I think the 3DS kind of, we, even, we don't think of it as being an AR platform, yet it's experimented with AR in some very interesting ways. One that comes to mind is Street Pass. Um, the fact that you have this near field communication, right. wireless yeah, communication, you pass by people, and then you have little interactions with each other. And I think yep. that they've I'm got. Really glad you brought that up. They, they've got a bunch of games that try to sort of take advantage of that, and it tends to be more like you've made this much progress in your game, they've made this much progress in their game, and you can, like, lend them an item, mm-hmm. or... Well, uh, Fire Emblem, you can, you can sort of battle, like, their yeah, team. Yeah, you, you can battle their team. Yeah, you have these little... And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, you can you can purchase items that they've collected and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's kind of like this, this sort of separate single-player experiences that kind of cross over every now and then. But I'd be curious to see, like, what further applications we could have for things like Street Pass. Um, you know, kind of the idea of you've got the, the Niantic, you know, geolocation style things where you have multiple people come together and they can all influence the same thing but what if you had something where it's not so much where you meet but it's like the number of people you have or something like that Mm -hmm. that affects what the game does. Alright so how about a game called Karma Mm. and what happens is you get these oh we'll call them we'll call them like uh, element boosts, elemental boosts right Mm -hmm. Um, you could go into like eastern culture where there's like 36 different Element mm-hmm. types, and you know, it's, it's all derived off of wood, and fire, and wood, and, fire, and yeah. metal, that sort of sawdust, thing. whatever. I, I, that's actually kind of like sawdust is wood. That's soy actually, sauce. That's actually kind of like Pokemon. <laughs> I just realized, but that's okay. Um, let's, let's just say that these are just perks. Yeah, they're just they're just things that that, that help your karma throughout the day as a game mechanic. Um, and so, uh, Chris, you get to choose which type of element you um, feel is your power element, mm-hmm. and that's basically your like one stat, but. Whatever is closest to that on the web um, of, of elements, mm. the element web, uh, you have affinities for. Mm. And so you can think, you know, you get just a general affinity for like the water types or for nature types or, or just anything that grows or, you know, whatever. Mm. Okay. And so there's that. I come up to you and I've got, uh, I've got the water type, you've got the nature type. And so my karma is going to positively affect your karma mm-hmm. and, and help your stuff to grow because of the, the water type, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're both playing the game and we basically ping off of each other mm-hmm. just by walking down the street. Mm-hmm. And if we happen to know each other, we can engage in some kind of activity. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that would be. Mm-hmm. Like uh, just sitting next to each other, that kind of thing. So what it would mean is you go to a theater and people are playing this game. You've got a bunch of people in there who have negative karma on you mm-hmm. and a bunch of people that have positive karma on mm-hmm. you. And it kind of, it's like, it's like this weird mm-hmm. mix of things. And, and, and you earn XP off of that. I don't know. I'm imagining the potential of something that combined the 3DS's near fi communication, right? Um, near field communication, um, with smartphones. If we had that on We're smartphones, talking about ad hoc networks. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if we had that functionality that you have on the 3DS, but not. It's not just people who own 3DSs and have StreetPass turned on. It's like everyone with a phone who has this app, right? Can right have well, these with Bluetooth, effects. for example. You could do it with Bluetooth. Easy, very easily. Mm-hmm. Um, you wouldn't have to. Mm-hmm. And one of the benefits of the 3DS with Street Pass is mm-hmm. that, you know, it essentially, as long as it's on, like, you don't have to really download anything. Yeah. It's just there. Mm-hmm. Whereas with an app on a phone, people have so many different types of phones. Mm-hmm. Are they going to have the app? Is it going to be compatible with, say, an older, an older model of, say, they have a Samsung phone, mm-hmm. a Galaxy phone? Is this app compatible with all models? Is it only compatible with right. some? Yeah. Is it also on the iPhone? It would have to become is the it, standard feature, right? Yeah. And so, I like the idea though of thinking mm-hmm. in in that sort of mm-hmm. sort of space. But I think it would also have to be something that is either. I mean, honestly, for it to be that successful, I think it has to be already pre-installed, mm-hmm. like a pre-installed thing that you can turn off, of yeah, course, yeah. just like Street Pass. Mm-hmm. But it's already there. You don't have. There's no like buy-in. So right. that way, you know, you get say uh, my parents, mm-hmm. who of course are older people at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, they have they have smartphones. And they sometimes play games on their smartphones. I'm not saying they don't. They do sometimes play games, especially my mom. Mm-hmm. But she may not know. Like if something like this came out, she may not be aware of it. Mm-hmm. She might be interested to to have that experience at least occasionally, like a casual user, like Doc was saying. But mm-hmm. she wouldn't even know it's there unless it came pre-installed mm-hmm. or unless there was some big advertising push. Right. So that's one hurdle I think to to consider is just mm-hmm. all these different 
devices that yeah. we have. And, you know, an interesting point about your Karma idea there, Doc, is that the Street Pass, mm-hmm. at least as far as I'm aware, doesn't work when you actually have the 3DS open and you're playing something. Mm-hmm. It's when they're both asleep that it turns that on. Right. And right. you have to pass by when you've got your systems asleep. So I'm not sure how easy or more, how difficult it would be to change it so that it happens both when they're asleep and when they're active. Um, I, I don't think it, it's it's a di- it's an issue of difficulty. I think it was an issue of battery power. It could be. Like with Pokemon Go, if you're not careful and you leave that on, oh yeah, and even if you're not using it, mm-hmm. it will sap your battery so quickly. Yeah. And so I, I imagine that probably Nintendo foresaw this that mm-hmm. oh hey Street Pass is, is a neat thing to mm-hmm. do, but if we're playing a game and then we always have Street Pass on, it's mm-hmm. going to just burn their battery. Oh, yeah. So let's One of just the first things they did that. was bring back low battery mode. In yeah. Pokemon. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, that that might be something where if batteries might need to get even stronger if we can do this mm-hmm. for people's phones, you know, for it to always work essentially. Yeah, and so it's kind of interesting to sort of project out and sort of imagine the sort of near future, almost sci-fi sort of thing of like, hey, I'm walking down the street and suddenly another player that's playing the same game we both see that we're playing we both turn the game on and we start like having like a little you know like laser fight duel up and down the street just because we have this like this little you know google glass like device on and we can just sort of do that at any time um but think of it like this chris mm -hmm. think of it like you're you live in a city in a city like say chicago we mentioned chicago or detroit Mm -hmm. you live in a garbage dump you know, I'm I'm sorry. Those are not very good cities, and I've actually been to both cities, so I can feel confident in saying that. <laughs> um, you don't want to live there, but what if? And I, well, with apologies to our fans, out right? Of but <laughs> it's, it's going to get worse. Is my point? It's like urban sprawl. These, you know, some of these areas that you're in may not look the nicest. To be fair, we do live in Dallas, <laughs> right? And and there are certain areas in Dallas that are not very nice. Yes, there are. So if you had these augmented reality, mm-hmm. you know, glasses on, perhaps this is one way to improve. Your outlook, just in general, you're walking around the street. Instead of seeing some dilapidated building, you see, oh, hey, that's that's a that's the Taj Mahal over there. That's a beautiful. I you can know, solve that just by giving some rose colored glasses, or just putting up right. put, postings like some artwork or a video or something like that on a wall. Right, face, you, or... but you kind of see where I'm going with this. It's, with it's it. like it could also be something where it could be a positive experience because if, if it's so common, like like for example, take again smartphones as an example. You might be thinking, well. These people in, that, that might be might live in an inner city in a bad area, they're not going to have access to something like this. Well, that's not really true because smartphones have become so ubiquitous that mm-hmm. everyone has them now. And so if, if we can get to that point with these sort of you know AR goggles, excuse me, or AR glasses or something of that sort, um, anyone could have them. It could be that sort of experience where everyone has these on mm-hmm. and generally just improve um, the city itself, the way things look. I'm not saying that necessarily that should replace garbage pickup. Yeah. But because, if you yeah, live in an area, right, there's, but if you, there's going to be resistance to this idea because people are going to be like, oh man, we're like, we're, we're just like glossing over the problems of the world and not actually fixing anything because we're just sort of, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're whitewashing everything with our virtual reality. That's, that's, I'm, I'm reality. thinking yeah. Eden program uh, <laughs> season two right now. <laughs> it's, and I'll just say that I do think that it could potentially be mood elevating, not just for and maybe I was going a little too far with it with like a horrible, you know, trash dump area of a city, like make that look better. Mm-hmm. And think of it more like boring cities because Dallas is kind of a boring city in a lot of ways well, in terms of fair, just the, the architecture is what I mean. And so, I, cause I don't think for the most part, Dallas is actually a pretty clean city, well maintained, Yeah, yeah. but boring. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of things are very spread out. You and have to graffiti drive to is get illegal. Anywhere. So, yeah. Like, I mean, I can even just say that being like, you get the graffiti app on this sure. whole thing, and sure. you walk down the street, and people have posted graffiti, virtual graffiti on the walls. Right. They, they can all enjoy because they're into it, but it's not actually vandalizing buildings. Right. So, th- th- this could be a very creative space. Perhaps someone, you know, creates art specifically for this. And puts it somewhere, and you can see it as long as you're wearing your your, your glasses. Or say, like you've got historical districts where you can actually someone like has made some animation that's like recreating. Um, yeah, what something it was that like, happened. It, it, like, well, yeah. Oh, I was even walk, thinking of that. Walk that's down the even better. And see, like, you know, here's what the street looked like in like 1400, or right. you know, here's something that happened here that we've recreated digitally. And so you can be walking down the street and see like the side of like you know some great battle or some speech or man, the historical societies need to get a hold of that. That'd they do. Great. That would be great if you go to you know you go to say uh, Gettysburg and you could see you you can relive the battle and then mm-hmm. you can take your kids and they can relive the battle and they could be scarred for life. <laughs> 
It's, it's a family <laughs> outing. Fantastic. Hey, if we're forward thinking enough, you know, we can be recording what it looks like now so that people in 100 years can be all excited. <laughs> it's, <laughs> wow, it was really boring. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably what they'd be saying. But that's the thing is, is to them it might not be. We can't. We can't know what. Oh, I don't. I think boredom was the farthest thing from their mind. People that were being like killed in that battle. <laughs> no, I'm talking about uh, people a hundred years from now looking at us. No, they they would think we're boring. I think. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> would they? We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, they, geez, their lives must be really boring it's if they think we're excited. It's a post-apocalypse, and they're like, "Wow, their 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 buildings are so tall and shiny and they clean. Had, they had easy access to food. Look at that! Bl- look at that blue sky. <laughs> Running water. Wow. Soap. Wow. <laughs> Restaurants. Well, I remember when those were legal. <laughs> oh, I remember toilet paper. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, now we're thinking. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, look, just think of the LARPing possibilities with something like this. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. Big time, big yeah. time. Cast a spell and actually see a fireball go and hit yeah. someone. And, yeah. yeah. And again, like that that's when we're getting back to that projecting out sort of thing that I was mentioning. But it's also interesting to think about what we can do right now with the tech that we have. And I think that it is a growing field and it's something that we can keep expanding upon. It's going to take iterations before we get to that point. Right. I think we can all kind of imagine where it might go. Maybe there's some things we're not even thinking of at this point. Um, but it is. I'm very interested to see where AR uh, what it can do now, where it can end up going in the future. Oh, I definitely agree. I think it's probably the oh, do I do I call it the peripheral or the the the, the elements? I don't know what to call, call it, but I think it's the one that has the most potential to grow and and explore and, and be something really really cool and really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I agree with you. You remember you remember three D televisions? How excited yes. people people were not about that, and how excited we were supposed to be about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think that that's where virtual reality is going to go. I mean, right. I'm, I'm super excited about you know the the things that are happening, and um, man, it was really cool to to be able to talk to Phil Johnson about Lucky's Tale and mm-hmm. and, and the things that they're uh, they're doing. But at the same time, you know, it's it's still tied to our to our sets, and it's still tied to our face. And and I just don't like having something on my face. Well, it's I think it goes beyond that too because I think. As, because of the internet and because of all these these social apps that we have now, mm-hmm. um, people are becoming connected more so than before. They're very true. And f- want to feel connected all the time. So when we have something like virtual reality, uh, I, I do think that there will be a place for it, but I think it's going to be a lot more niche than they think it's going to be. Yeah. A lot of these companies think it's going to be, it's just going to replace video games. Well, look at where video games are. I mean, I still love single-player video games. I do. Mm-hmm. But... Honestly, it's it's the multiplayer games that are getting that are that are the most widespread now. They're the ones that are getting all the money. They're the mm-hmm. ones that are bringing in all these new people to gaming. It's multiplayer games. It's not new single player games. And they're going to be multiplayer VR games. But you'd also, I'm not sure to what extent you're counting on everyone playing having that VR. Platform. Right. I- exactly. And and when you have something like, but if you compare the multiplayer possibilities mm-hmm. of virtual reality versus augmented reality there's no there's no comparison there mm-hmm. because augmented reality you also have the benefit of actually being there physically mm-hmm. and so you have this mixture of both and that's something that you get when you say for example something like facebook or a twitter mm-hmm. to use a couple of apps that hey in five years they may they may not be here they may be replaced by something else but there will be something else is the point and augmented reality could be a, a big part of that mm-hmm. and these are experiences that these are these are ways to connect people, but they're also ways that people connect in person, too. So it plays off of everything together. Right. And that's, that's, that's the direction that I think that we're going just kind of as a society, mm-hmm. as, as the way that we interact. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I could be wrong, but, I mean, that's kind of what I think. It's, it's funny. I saw, and I forget where it was exactly. I'd credit it if I, if I remembered. But there was, like, this little sort of two-panel webcomic I saw. And first was, like, the sort of black and white. It's, it's a cartoon, but it's black and white illustration of a bunch of people sitting in a train staring at their screens. Mm. And, um, like, there's kind of, like, the, the sort of standard line that you always hear about, like, man, our, our devices are making us le- antisocial, less social, you know. Like, we're all we're doing is staring at our screens and not living life. And then they show that same image with everyone in color. And instead of like having like these sort of like blank stares, like these frowns, they're all smiling, and like it's showing what they're doing on the screen. And it's people like talking right. like, "Hey, can't wait to see you later," you know. And would you mind picking this up for dinner tonight? And you know, I, it's it's they're, they're I've seen that with I've seen that too. And mm-hmm. and while I both agree and disagree with that comic, yeah. because I think what's missing there is 
people should be doing should be having all these experiences. Mm-hmm. They should be doing both. Yeah. And and what they're implying with that is they are doing both. It's just that, no, but it, they're not because mm-hmm. they're ignoring the people that are sitting right next to them oh, I see to talk to people that aren't there. Mm-hmm. I'm saying they should be doing both. They should be talking with people that are there and communicating socially. And see, I think that's what augmented reality does. Mm-hmm. It does both. It does, mm-hmm. yeah. That's the benefit, and that's where I think that we're headed. And that will solve that problem yeah. where people say, well, these devices, all they do is just make you be insular and not want to mm-hmm. talk with people. Because I've noticed this as, as I've become – I've grown into being a more social person. I've kind of had to mm-hmm. in a lot of the work that I do. And I've noticed this all the time where if I don't initiate conversation with, conversation with people, mm-hmm. they don't say anything. People yeah. just want to be – locked in their own space so i have to always feel, i have to feel like i'm the one to be like hey how's it going good mm-hmm. morning hey what do what you do what do you do here what's mm-hmm. your you know just communicate and nine times out of ten people actually want that experience but they don't know how to initiate it mm-hmm. or they don't know if you're going to want it yeah, or, yeah. Or, and so you, it's very true if, if you have this buy-in of the augmented reality of you know hey it's like an icebreaker mm-hmm. it's like hey i've got this game you've got this game mm-hmm. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's not a game. Maybe it's just some sort of experience. Mm-hmm. Pokemon Go. It, it it just touches the the surface of augmented reality, mm-hmm. but it's brought people physically together. Oh, yeah, there's there all these tons stories, of stories, right? Mm-hmm. Of people that come together, that that go into a space, and people that would normally never communicate with one another, mm-hmm. and yet guys, you'd cross the street to make sure you didn't have to pass. Exactly, and yet you you realize, hey, we're both playing Pokemon Go. Oh, hey, did you catch that? You know, Charizard. Yeah. Over there? <laughs> it becomes this this bonding experience, and you realize, you know, wait a minute, this person's really not that different from me. Mm-hmm. That's right. I have no reason to be afraid of this person. He's just going about his life, and he's playing this cool game that I like to play, too. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, I'm looking forward to the eventual AR Pokemon where you can actually um, be like, hey, so-and-so wants to battle, and you like right there on the spot <laughs> yes. to do an actual Pokemon battle in the style of the Pokemon you know, handheld slash console games. Yeah. I, think, I think everyone was waiting for that. Yeah. that the, what they did was they just time-shifted that yeah. as a design decision so that you have to do it in the context of gyms. Mm-hmm. Right. It, make, it makes sense for where we're at with the technology and that sort of thing, but I am looking forward, though, to more active AR, augmented yeah. reality, as opposed to kind of like the passive uh, asynchronous AR that we that's have right. right now. Well, and I think a lot of that's going to be whenever we use our phones as kind of a cloud to be able to process all the things that are happening in real time in a region. Instead of uh, you look at the server to see what's happening, I look at the server mm-hmm. to see what's happening, and we're relying on the mobile network to mm-hmm. be able to keep up with our so-called battle. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think it's going to be more like our phones are talking to each yeah. other and being like, yeah, this is happening and right now. They can do that right now, but it needs to be quicker and easier and more seamless. That's right. Um, it, it can't be like, okay, we both need to have the app open, we both have to have Bluetooth turned on, we both have to go to multiplayer and find, okay, there you are, and now it's going to load and sync, and like, okay, now we're playing. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Because uh, that's how multiplayer games are now are on phones. Um, or even on, like, say, the 3DS or whatever other, you know, the Vita, you, you know, pick your poison. Uh, that's, yeah. how it, that's how it goes. Nobody takes take the Vita. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> um, Actually, Vita has a very passionate fan base. Yeah. <laughs> very small. <laughs> so I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable fashion. insulting them because they're very small. But <laughs> Like punk rock. Right, there you go. I think punk rock was much bigger, actually, than... Well, not now. <laughs> oh, well, I, I didn't buy the, buy the Vita for this, but pretty much the only game I've played for more than a few hours. Um, well, I did play a little bit of um, Virtue's Last Reward, but um, I played basically just the re-release of a PS2 game, uh, Persona 4, and that, that was there my main go. Vita game. I know so. a lot of people that have had the same experience with yeah. the Vita. So Yeah. Okay, I think that was a good discussion, though, over augmented reality. Mm-hmm. I'm voting. I'm voting augmented reality over virtual reality. That's one vote. Doc? Yeah. Oh, th- yeah Two I, votes? That was uh, never any question for me. Chris? I, I really want to play Eve Valkyrie, but I do, yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued by AR. I think it's. I think it's going to blow up much. You got to vote for one. You can't. You can't be on the fence on this one. This is election year. If we're if keep in mind, Chris, mm-hmm. it is impossible to wear a VR helmet of any variety and not look like an incredible dork. Yeah, don't be a That's dork. That's subjective. Chris. <laughs> no, no. I I really think we could do a study. <laughs> but I mean, you vote can find for the cool or vote for. You dork. can find the coolest guy there is. And, and, and put him into that and give him three minutes to forget that there are people watching <laughs> and he will just wander around like a complete nerd. I mean, it's just, uh, no. <laughs> you can't. We like nerds on this show, though. Come on. Come on, Tom. Not those kind of nerds. Oh, okay. Not those. The wrong kind. Yeah, wrong kind, man. Um, there, there's, there's nerds and then there's nerds. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dork. Yeah. Geek. 
Well, a geek and nerd are two different things. They're very and different. So are dorks. So. Yeah, well, I, I have a Venn diagram. Google it. Yeah, there you yeah. go. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 81 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our look at augmented reality games. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. <laughs>